All right, hope you guys are doing good. We're here with another edition of KC Music Talk. Today I have a recording extraordinaire, Andrew Wilson. How, How you doing? doing? Good, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So you and I met over at Green Lady. Correct. And, uh, and I was looking for always, you know, more people to come on the show and say what they, uh, you know, tell what they do or whatever. And, um, and then, uh, you know, Lonnie perked up and he, he, you know, really appreciated what you're doing at Black Dolphin with him. And yeah, so, yeah. so he, he gave you quite a recommendation there, but, um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah man, gotten, thank you. A lot of people said some good things and you and I haven't really talked very much, only a couple of times. Yeah, it's just um, been incidental run-ins. Right, right. And, uh. So, so tell everybody, and for me as well, you know, a little bit about your background yeah. and stuff. Um, I'm a musician, I'm an audio engineer, I'm a post-production engineer. Um, I was born and raised in Springfield, Missouri, and that's obviously where I kind of got my start with everything. Um, my parents had me start taking piano lessons when I was eight years old, and that uh, continued all the way through high school, and then I picked up a few other instruments along the way. Um, I started violin when I was in middle school, or no, fifth grade, and then uh, did piano and violin through middle school, and then picked up a guitar when I was a teenager, because, you know, you got to impress the girls somehow, and just, who doesn't Violin's not impressing the girls? <laughs> what are you saying? No, <laughs> but uh, in high school is where I really started to find my own relationship with music, mm -hmm. and started to really get into how technology worked alongside and also could be used to create music. Um, I was the only student in my high school that was, that graduated uh, participating in every ensemble the school offered <laughs> Wow. And then uh, I went on to the uh, UMKC Conservatory, um, initially as an instrumental music ed major, mm -hmm. and then uh, finished up as a vocal performance major. Oh, wow. So I, what I like to tell people now when they ask me, well, what do you play? I basically tell them, well, if it makes noise, I'm, I'm into it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my, my time at UMKC was extremely formative, both musically and from an audio standpoint, because they offered elective audio courses, um, just kind of like an intro to recording, and then the 200 level course, and then the 300 level was a little more intensive, and you could record a band, and then they had a, like an independent study slash internship that you could do mm -hmm. as far as, you know, you go and record the recitals and concerts, edit them, bounce them out, mm -hmm. or uh, one year uh, or one semester, they decided to implement a streaming student-run radio station. Mm -hmm. So I was involved with that, helping set that up and researching equipment, and I, I was completely green to broadcast audio, mm -hmm. so that was a great yeah. learning experience. But uh, that led to my first paying audio gig at a big church in Lenexa, and I did that for a few years, and then that led to me uh, working at Guitar Center for a while, and then at Big Dudes mm -hmm. Music for a while, um, and then a couple other churches, a lot of independent contracting gigs, and then eventually Green Lady and Black Dolphin came around. Mm -hmm. So it's been just this weird kind of snowball rolling downhill, uh, a lot of being, as far as professional success, being in the right place at the right time, always being willing mm -hmm. to talk to people and network, and mm -hmm. and it just you know it just kind of happened the way that it did. And now here we are. Yeah, so, cool, man. Yeah. So like, uh, I wasn't gonna ask you this, but it sounds like you you sang at a you know mildly pretty high level. I mean, if mm -hmm. you're singing at college, um, I think I saw uh, on your Facebook you went to like the Barber Seville or something. Or, yeah, you saw yeah. That I, somewhere. Oh and, man, the and, the Lyric Opera of Kansas City is just such an amazing company mm -hmm. and I being a voice major opera is a huge part of it and a yeah. lot of classical vocal literature and stuff like that um, so whenever I get the free time to go see a production there sure. I absolutely love it uh, Barbara of Seville was amazing mm -hmm. uh, the last one I went to was their production of West Side Story mm -hmm. which was which unbelievable. I'm sure it was great yeah, unbelievable yeah, yeah. yeah what do you, what do you think about opera in general opera is in a very weird place right now because there is so much music happening all the time as and across so many different genres. And opera historically has been something that has been, especially in our society, considered music for high society. Right. And it's very difficult for younger listeners to appreciate the art form because A, it's in a, mu in a 
in a language they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And then they're very, sometimes very, very long, you know, um, the, the ring cycle takes days. Nine to hours or something, yeah. 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 Um, hours or so, yeah. So it's, it's in a weird place. So directors are trying to do new things to make it more relatable and make it more modern. Mm-hmm. And, and that has yielded some really, really cool things, mm-hmm. some very interesting things, some things that I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely in a, a, I would say, a period of reformation. Yeah. Because classical works from, you know, from Mozart, Rossini, you know, all of all the standard operas that most mm-hmm. people are familiar with, they're having to be done in very different ways to still be relevant, mm-hmm. which is very interesting to see. But what, on the other side of things, the new operas that are coming out are really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. I went and saw a uh, one act that the Lyric put on called Everest. Mm-hmm. And it was this really interesting one act opera written around climbers. Um, I forget the uh, the climbers' names that that passed away. It, it, it's based on a true story of these climbers that are scaling Everest and they don't make it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a very, as far as the orchestral accompaniment, it's pretty reduced. It's not as in depth as you would think. So a lot of the drama is conveyed by the singing itself and the actors on stage. And what was really cool was the set they chose to build for it. It was a lot of white cubes. And then there were various passageways where the actors could come up out of this mountain of cubes that they created. And then they were 3D projecting on this massive mountain of white cubes. So oh, as far weird. as the just the concept of the music itself and then the set and just the, the entire compilation of all the components of the show, it was really, really interesting to see. Mm-hmm. And of course, it was written in English too, which yeah. definitely helps for a younger crowd, or yeah. somebody that's not as familiar. You know, having to read super titles the whole time can be kind of a stretch. Oh yeah, I get the impression like because I've done. Let's see, what did we do? We did the Carmelites in the mm-hmm. pit because mm-hmm. uh, I was playing violin. Um, Mary Widow, we did, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did. I can't remember which handle one we did, but it was a you know kind of mainstream handle opera. And mm-hmm. So you know, a couple of them. I get the impression that I don't think it's the stage show part that, that a lot of people get turned off by because people are watching musicals all the time. Right. You know, right. and so, so I, don't, I don't think that's the problem. And it's because, it, again, it, when, when I hear something like Marriage of Figaro, I'm like, this is just awesome Mozart with singing. Yeah. I'll listen to this all day, <laughs> you know, at least from my mm-hmm. angle with the, with the violin playing. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of, so obviously, Barbara Seville, and there's a lot of them like that, that this is just like, classical romantic stuff with oh, yeah. singing yeah. in it. And so I'll, I'll listen to that all day. But I get the impression that a lot of people, yeah, I think it's like you said, the, the, the different language thing is annoying. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's something that they don't want to deal with. But uh, it's definitely the style of singing too. It's, Absolutely. It, you know, Absolutely. It's the, you know, that you yeah. have all that kind of stuff. And, and it's too bad. Cause, and, and I'm glad to hear that, that a lot of people... So it sounds like what you're saying is that there's a lot of people that are trying to write new ones that are that are a little bit more updated. Mm-hmm. I mean, are they are they are they trying to like go the music theater route with it, but with Ish, opera style singing, not, or is it like I wouldn't even go that far. I mean, yeah. yes, that's a thing, and that's yeah. that's been happening for the better part of a century. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Vile was kind of the first to start bridging that divide between opera and musical theater mm-hmm. and and stage shows of that time with like street scene. That was a that was a show that was definitely really trying to bridge the gap as far as the subject matter, how it's portrayed, the different vocal styles that are involved. Mm-hmm. It was definitely kind of the the Rosetta Stone between the opera world and the music theater world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was, I mean, that was, I think that came out in the twenties. Yeah, yeah. What do you? Okay, so on a different subject with with singing in general, what? Do you find yourself really critical with other genres of singing, like rock guys singing or pop music? Or what, do you, what do you think about when that? When I was younger, I was definitely more critical. Now I would say I'm more observant. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I can be critical if it's you know, something where it's somebody with poor technique or something mm-hmm. like that, making these ill-informed artistic cho- choices. Yeah. Anyway, that, <laughs> that's right. a rant for another day. Yeah. But for the most part, I'm more observant as far as just seeing what they're doing and how that works with the music that they're trying to sing and portray. Yeah. And especially in the classical world, I try to be more observant because it's so easy to get in that mindset of, well, 
ugh, why did they do that? Ugh, right, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. the wrong attitude. And that's part of the issue with opera having to go through a lot of the changes that it's going through mm. is even the people that are involved, you know, people that are in academic singing, whether it's undergrad or graduate or postgraduate, it's very easy to get in this comparison mindset and then that which turns into judgment and that's really mm -hmm. the wrong way to look at it and it's a i would say it's an unhealthy way to carry yourself in that artistic arena because it it makes you especially if you don't have the success that you envision yourself having that expectation versus reality on top of that critical judgment of your peers it it's kind of this perfect storm that pulls you away from your initial love for the art form Mm, and that's that's, yeah. that's something that has it's been a hard lesson learned myself over a period of time mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting because like when i when i sing i i lead sang in my band my the band that i ran for a little bit and that was really interesting because i definitely had this this sort of like josh groban kind of mm -hmm. attitude where i'm like Okay, breath support, diaphragm, you know, I'm going through all this stuff so I can, because also just, just having enough oomph to do four hours, you know, and I'm like, if I don't do this, I'm done. I mean, if I'm yeah. just doing throat, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. and, but at the same time, I was realizing that, uh, I guess you could take like any like heavier rock singer, like maybe a, a Kurt Hammett or something from Metallica, you know, who's who's singing but but like purposely putting that growly stuff and purposely sounding very rock mm -hmm. when you go hear josh groban you know i mean it's like oh, you no know perfect technique i mean he's blasting over everybody you know mm -hmm. like and so I, i'm always interested with singers because it, it just seems like when we hear people's voices it's way different than hearing their music because i mean mm -hmm. we can tell axel rose's voice in one oh, yeah. second you can tell that billy uh Who's the guy for Smashing Pumpkins? Billy Corgan was yeah, that his Billy name. Corgan, yeah. But any of those kinds of guys that have a very, very distinct voice. Or you go, you know, you know the grungier singers like Lane Staley from Alice in Chains, mm -hmm. um, or um, oh man, definitely Kurt Cobain had a oh, very, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, you could barely tell what he was mm -hmm. saying on purpose. And that that's another thing that in the enunciation thing. Mm -hmm. See, I think maybe not grow band specifically, but definitely in musicals. I mean, they're like nice, you know, and they make sure you, mm -hmm. you enunciate so you can get it out to mm -hmm. the audience. But then you go back to Kurt Cobain and he doesn't give a crap if you know what he's singing that's, about. That's part of, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> I know there's a lot it's, there. There's, there's know, a yeah. lot there. Cause with, with musical theater, you're telling a story or yeah. with opera, you're telling a story and everything about what you do on that stage has to be big because the person at the back row of that, 1500 or 2000 seat hall has to be able to see and hear what you're doing and with opera I mean there's no or very little uh, Amplification right. it, it does happen depending on the show or if there's electronic elements that kind of deal it does happen those guys don't need it No, dude, they're they their voices are monster especially I mean, yeah. you look at you know your the the held in variety of singers the heroic Wagnerian singers mm -hmm. those people just have voices that are absolutely larger than life as far as volume, expressivity, I mean, just cannons of sound. They blast over the whole orchestra. You, yeah, you look yeah. at like Leontine Price or Jesse Norman uh -huh. that can sing Wagner, they can sing Strauss, and it's just, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, like, I, that just cracked me up. And the same thing kind of happened with my violin playing, too, is I was, because you're taught... Just like you guys, you use good breath support. You, you know, you're never, you know, you, you have a good posture. And, and the same thing happened with my, um, with, what do you call it? The efficiency of my I bowing and stuff. Okay. And then when I'm over in rock, this doesn't look very neat. You know, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, too. yeah, you got to. And so that always cracked me up when I was trying to sing. And I realized that I needed to have a different attitude if I'm going to do this, uh, plush you know stone temple mm -hmm. pilots cover oh or something. yeah yeah you, know, yeah, you gotta yeah. kind of get in uh stone temple pilots mode and um so I, like i said so you you haven't been you haven't been too judgy about that it sounds no. like recently because that i mean uh, that the other part of my musical appreciation vocally i've always loved soul and rock music that's mm. what got me into it in the first place is just singing into my remote to shine down when I was 14 and just all angsty. And 
I love that stuff, man. And yeah. it, and after going through school for voice, you know, I, I was able to kind of figure out how these guys, the, the, the people that do more of the, the gravelly stuff, you know, we talk about classical singers that have all of this power that they're able to put out there. But the beauty with a lot of modern rock and grunge is, you know, it's amplified. You can let that amplification work for you. And that's how a lot of these guys are able to do this gravelly stuff is they're not having to push as hard yeah. and they can introduce some of these manufactured sounds without having to overdo it. Mm -hmm. Now, not to say that that doesn't happen because how many singers have you heard of that develop nodules and mm -hmm. have to take a break or get surgery? Right. So it, it absolutely does happen. But the ones that are still around and are still relevant, they understand that you know there's a certain technique to it. You can let the amplification work for you. You don't have to push as hard. Mm -hmm. So a perfect example of that might be uh, Steven Tyler. You know, I've heard he is very classically trained or he went to Berkeley or some, you know, grade school or whatever. And he does. I mean, he screams in every single song. It's like mm -hmm. in his contract. <laughs> you know, I'm just joking. But, you know, but he, he has on the, is actually scream. On. Yeah, right. Scream on. That's funny. Uh, but yeah, he might be one of those examples that probably does know some really you know, quality training technique, but still takes it into this other realm and mm -hmm. is able to, and that, that's funny because I heard somebody talking about on stage as opposed to camera acting where the uh, camera is right in your face exactly, and it's different, right? It's like you're saying, you have you to project. You can be so much more or, reserved. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. You, but you can't do that on stage, right? right. You can't be reserved because they don't get it. Yeah, because you don't see it. It just looks like you're standing there. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, so with, with that idea of dealing with the mics or whatever, that's mm -hmm. kind of an inter interesting transition. So t tell me a little bit more about your like recording stuff that you've done. So recording stuff, that really started at UMKC. Mm -hmm. um, I started taking those classes, and they had this brilliant recording studio um, up on the fifth floor of the PAC. And initially, they, they did a, a remodel while I was there. So I got to experience the studio in two different formats. And the original format was a 24 bus Neo Tuckalon that the school had purchased from Chuck Berry, or so I was told. Um, and then it, they had a Pro Tools rig, but it was they still had a 24 inch or 24 track two inch tape recorder too. So I got to play around with a large format inline analog board with reel to reel tape, mm. outboard gear, you know, the old school way to do yeah. it. But still got to do in the box stuff and summing through an analog board. Mm. And then they rebuilt the studio. And they sold that console and got an SSL Duality, which is this beautiful British-made, super analog, digitally controlled inline console. It's, it's one of the best ones out there. So I got to play around with that and experience you know, the cutting edge of recording technology. And then I was able to bring in groups just for, for an ac academic setting of recording them to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. So I got to experiment as far as both tracking and recording. And it just I developed this knack for it. Um, during our, during the 300 level course that I took, um, we had to book time to go in and mix things. So I would book these long blocks of time at night where I could just stay in there and do things. And then eventually when I was doing the independent studies, I had a key to the control room or to the mm -hmm. studio. So I could go up there and you know, when I was still doing piano before I had fully transitioned to voice, I was using the, the piano in, that, in the studio to practice mm -hmm. on because it was a nice seven foot Steinway, mm -hmm. got tuned every week, as opposed to the practice room pianos. Mm -hmm. So I might be incriminating myself now, but that's <laughs> fine. But uh, I got to stay up there and I could experiment and I had this basically lab setting where I could do all of these things and experience how different microphones capture things, how, you know, how do you make a, a DI cheap guitar sound okay? Because at the mm -hmm. time I had this pretty inexpensive acoustic guitar that mm -hmm. I would bring up there just and I would mic it, then I would record it through the DI and into this super nice console and see what would happen. And mm -hmm. It was just a very experimental period for, for me where I learned a lot. And eventually, um, that led to a position at a, at a big church doing live audio. And for me, that was an interesting transition because I had done predominantly studio stuff in this kind of vacuum academic setting. Perfect setting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With all of this top notch, top shelf equipment. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in this pretty big space. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was yeah. seated a couple thousand people. Right. It was, uh, 
they had a 48 channel Allen Heath console with a bunch of outboard compressors. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the, the older format of live audio and it had a mono distributed PA system. So it was kind of like, whoa, this is very different. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of learning that happened there. Um, that particular place, they had done a system upgrade while I was there and they went from this distributed system to line arrays, a digital console. Uh, they were booking tours so I was put in contact with tour managers to make sure writers were compliant with the space and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it was, I really got thrown into the deep end, mm -hmm. but man, I learned so much about how the live side of things operate and how do you take the concept of trying to get the best end result possible in a studio and how do you bring that into the live audio environment? How do you use the tools that are available to you to create the best possible end product. Mm -hmm. And that was that was definitely a big learning experience there that yeah. I, I've been able to carry over to pretty much any space that I work in because every space is different and it has its own challenges as far as the system and what the system can do and what the system can do within that space. Mm -hmm. So even going from there to this huge room to say Black Dolphin, right? Black Dolphin has its own unique challenges too. Mm -hmm. And there are some groups that, you know, you just can't do a lot with the PA because the group is big. You know, if you have a big band in there, you've got anywhere from 12 to 15 horns. Mm -hmm. And you might have solo mics when, you know, the, the structure of the music comes down a little bit. But as far as miking every single horn, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. The room's too small for that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also, like, that's also taught me, you know, okay, where do I use reinforcement where do I not use reinforcement yeah it, that was one of my questions is to ask you kind of about different uh, different rooms of I know one famous one for all of us to kind of play rock stuff is uh, Llewellyn's oh, and yeah. Llewellyn's you know has these kind of high ceilings mm -hmm. and it's a very and, very 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 live yeah <laughs> yeah and then I'm sure uh, something like Green Lady where I know do they do they have a lot of like curtains and stuff in there? There's a lot of curtains. So that so that's is a lot that of descriptive a, material. Yeah, is that actually like doing anything, or is that just kind of a of wives' tale or something aesthetic. that they? It's a well, it's it is definitely an aesthetic, mm -hmm. but that aesthetic also has some function to it mm -hmm. as well. Luckily, and with Green Lady, it's. And I don't mean them specifically. I just mean people saying carpet and curtains. Oh, yeah, and yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that really, fibrous material. Is that really dampening stuff as much as people think it is? Not as much as people think it does, mm -hmm. but it does do something. Mm -hmm. If you stand in a room that has a hardwood floor and parallel walls and you clap your hands, you can hear that flutter echo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you put a curtain on one of those two parallel walls, all of a sudden that flutter echo goes away. Mm. Now it's not going to lessen the audible volume of the clap, but the reflections that are adding unwanted extra stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. adding extra space or noise to that initial sound, that does make a difference. Yeah. And a lot of people see treatment panels on walls in studios <clears throat> or churches or venues or whatever, and they're like, oh, soundproofing. And not necessarily. Soundproofing and sound treatment are two very different things. Mm. Treatment is where you basically add different materials to try and adjust the room to get rid of unwanted reverberation or unwanted issues such as standing waves, which is what I talked about earlier where you clap your hands between two parallel walls and you hear that. Yeah, yeah. When you're trying to record or if you have you know, mic'd instruments with sensitive condenser microphones, that comes across. And it can also be... You know, various acoustic anomalies can create things like feedback if you're dealing with monitors and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, sure. It's so, so this has been my question. With a room like Llewellyn's, where it is very live, and I think you're standing on a wooden box, basically. <laughs> I've heard that, like, it, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, is, would you want to turn, would you want to turn the lows down a little bit? Or it what? Depends. How how would you deal with that? Like with a let's say a regular guitar, bass, and drums kind of band with a male singer, would you want to turn those lows down or what? How well, it depends on where the low frequency is coming from. So if you're playing on a hollow wooden stage, if it's a situation where you've got a big old ampeg eight by ten rig up there that's yeah. just a, a fridge of low frequency, even that can that low frequency with that amplifier sitting on top of the stage, it's coupled to the structure. 
So that low frequency will transduce into the material of the stage and create resonance. Yeah. And if, oh. if it's not properly constructed and not properly insulated, the structure starts to... Oh. Yeah. So you're talking about, let's say, if you have the monitors and they're literally hanging from the ceiling, that's a different thing because they're yeah. not on they're the not stage. they're not setting yeah. on yeah. and they're yeah, not I making contact you. with it. Yeah, okay. So it, it depends on where so the depends. low frequency is coming from on that. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I, I would think that, because you mentioned the church, right? Mm -hmm. And like my parents go to atonement. So they're like, it, you know, it's it's got insane reverb in there already. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so you, I mean, would you just take out all the reverb in that place? Not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it, it just depends. Again, it depends on the space itself. What does the space sound like acoustically? Is it pleasing? And especially if you're, and it, it also depends on what style of music are you doing sure. in that space. Yeah. Is it contemporary is it more traditional do you have an orchestra do you have a choir mm -hmm. and the second you introduce a band that's a little higher volume that can be a different challenge because that reverberation or that that live element of the room um if you have tr a lot of transients like from cymbals yeah that reverberation depending on the space you know 2k could be elevated in that space mm -hmm. and 2k is a very unpleasant frequency to have a lot of yeah. Or two to three K. Right. It can be very unpleasant to the listener. So if you have that at a high volume, it's just Right. But it not every room does that. But mm -hmm. i my point is if that does happen, then you have to think about, okay, what are we doing here that incites that? Do we go for treating the room or do we change our program material to work within the space that we have? Mm -hmm. I would think like trap sets would be rough in a church. They can be. It, yeah, it depends, like, you know. Or it, amps, I guess. Am, amps, you know, what, turning up too loud. Yeah. Too loud, what I'm a sure. lot of churches do, and the one that I currently work for does this as well, is there's a separate room that you have your amplifiers in. You got <laughs> mic lines back there to mic the amps and stuff. So you still get the amp tone, yeah. and you just mic it, and it goes through the system. But that 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 lowers stage noise quite a bit. Yeah. Wow. Well, so so here's another like sound question for you. What do you think about miking drums? Again, that uh, depends on the room that you're mm -hmm. in and, and, you know, the drummer. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I generally do, in a live setting, like to mic drums. Um, I've kind of come up with a, a method at Black Dolphin that's started to work really well for me um, because it's, it's a smaller room, but it still has high ceilings and a mm -hmm. little bit of depth to it. Don't always have to mic the drum kit, but with larger groups like, like Boogaloo 7... You know where it's it's pretty funky and and you you want you want to hear that kick drum that's mm -hmm. that's part of you know the nuance of that group yeah so without miking that you lose a lot of it so what I do there is I'll put just a kick drum mic on the kick drum itself and then I have an overhead and that generally captures most of the kit yeah and in that room where you can already hear you know the top portions of the kit pretty well mm -hmm. I don't really feel I need to close mic everything. Whereas the, the church that I work for, they have a lot of different volunteer drummers, so you never know what you're getting on any given Sunday, and it, they do like to get pretty bumping, and they have the drum kit in a cage, too, so you really do have to individually... You mean with the glass yeah. around? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've so, seen those a lot on yeah. bigger stages. That was weird the first time I ever saw it, and mm -hmm. I was, it kind of freaked me out, I didn't know what it... Was. And so, like, so, because I've seen a lot of guys dr mic bass drum and if they're gonna you know if they have to they'll mic the bass drum and then kind of leave everything else to and so you're saying that the bass drum a lot of times gets kind of drowned out by the set once it can in a get while. drowned out by what else is happening on stage especially mm -hmm. if you've got you know a loud bass amp or leslie or something and it you know it's one thing to have a bass line but to have that percussive low frequency too that really fills in the texture mm -hmm. and i really then this is just my preference, but I, I like to have that in a live environment, even in a jazz club. Mm -hmm. And okay, here's another question. So with my violin, for example, I'll throw, um, you know, I have two, uh, two amps, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then mm -hmm. I think it sounds pretty good, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and it yeah. sounds at my, my bags pickup that I have, I think mm -hmm, it sounds mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. violin like. And then I'll, I might maybe run a, uh, a little bags preamp thing. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it sounds very violin-like. As soon as I put that through basically any, you know, monitors, it comes out bright as crap. And mm -hmm. it really annoys the crap out of me. Well, that's... And, you know... 
I don't know what to do about that mm -hmm. because on these bigger places, I can bring my DeVille, which is sitting right there. Which is just creamy and which awesome. Which is, yeah. it, it sounds great. And then I can kind of use that. So, so for example, at a place like a Green Dolphin, I would think that would go through this kind of tunnel that that, that uh, room is. But when you get a really wide stage, you can't use something like that. I Not mean, you got to have, you, you don't think so? I don't yeah. Think so. And it, yeah. it also, it boils down to your preference as a performer. You know, you could, if you prefer the sound of your instrument through that amplifier, just play through that amplifier and mic it. And then you can have that come back through monitors if need be. Well, that, that's what I'm kind of saying. It, like sometimes when you mic it, it comes out nice and awesome through the amp, but then when it comes through these mains, mm -hmm. it's all bright. Well, that it, also it, falls yeah. on uh, whoever's engineering. Yeah. You know, that's, that's their responsibility to make that as true of a representation through the system as it is coming from the amplifier itself. Mm -hmm. And it is up to them to know what microphones work well with those amplifiers, what tips and tricks they need to do in that room to make it sound the way it needs to sound. And instrument too. And the yeah, instrument yeah, as yeah, well, yeah. 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 And it, it, and Violin it, as opposed to bass or whatever. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, they're all different animals. And then you have, you know, with, with bags, you, it's a piezo pickup going through a preamp and then out to wherever it's going. And that responds a lot different than an electric guitar that has, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of humbuckers or a strat with some single coils. You know, they've they've got a very different characteristic to them and the way they transduce, you know, they're they're transducing fluctuations in a magnetic field instead of vibration. Mm. Which a piezo is literally transducing vibration. Yeah, right. So the characteristics are drastically different. Yeah. And the, the so the guitar is going through all this circuitry and this is coming it, it, I mean this is like mic it's vibration, so yeah. it's not exactly mic, but it's it's, it's you're still transducing. You yeah. know, with a with a microphone you're capturing the movement of the air molecules coming from whatever sound source it is, and then that is captured by a small capsule whether it's a dynamic or condenser yeah. and then that's transduced into voltage and then it goes yeah. from there and but this is vibration on the the would you say the piezo yeah yeah, yeah, the, yeah the style mics yeah that's interesting and so with that frustration from the the musician to because with our band i mean we're running our sound so so ah, that that's, that's now tricky. our bass player's fault you know greg, <laughs> greg get my sound like right if him. you're watching no i'm just giving you crap <laughs> But, but so let's say at another place like a, you know, your guys' place or a record bar or whatever mm -hmm. that, that has a sound guy, I find uh, the brick or any of these, you know, I find that sometimes I always felt this as a kid where it was like, we had this idea that it was like the kids versus the adults, <laughs> you know what I mean? And now it doesn't feel like that, obviously, yeah. but, uh, it, or, or the kids versus the teacher. And, and we don't have to get into this, but I've talked to a lot of musicians about the club owner versus the musicians uh -huh. and this unfortunate attitude. But I get that same idea sometimes with the, with the sound guy and the musicians. <laughs> it's like a versus thing. It you sure know, I mean, have be, you gotten yeah. that before? I have. Yeah. Um, just the you know, sound guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, oh yeah, like, and yeah. I've experienced it on both sides. Both you know, musicians trying to come at me like I don't know what I'm doing, or in groups that I've played in, dealing with an audio engineer that's less than hospitable, <laughs> and and it's tricky for me because you know this dude doesn't know me at all, right. and if I try to pipe up and say something. If I say, well, oh, I'm, I'm a sound guy too. Right. They've yeah. heard they've heard that a thousand times before, and they're right. just like, man, this guy is just being one of those yeah. jerks. So it's it's tricky. You're you're gonna have your engineers who are kind of curmudgeons, and it's it's like we talked about in singing as far as you know observing versus being critical of other singers. Engineers yeah. do that too, as far as what equipment people bring to a show, mm -hmm. what they do, you know, as far as professionalism dealing with an amplified environment where you have somebody that is effectively moderating that environment behind a console. Mm -hmm. And some engineers are just like, oh, why did, oh, why do they bring that? Why do they do that? And, and yeah, you, know, right, you get very right. curmudgeon because you're, you're being critical. You're not observing. And as the engineer, you have a lot of power to go up to somebody and be like, hey man, in this room, that amp is way too loud it doesn't make sense for it to be as loud as it is can you turn it down a little bit just so it sounds the best that it can in here mm -hmm. yeah. and some people will push back and be like man it's just it's my tone yeah. like, doesn't matter man this thing's piping up 110 mm -hmm. db don't don't need that we got mics tone, tone and volume are two different things you know exactly. that, that, that's something i get on with country guys is they'll say the word tone like 
you mean volume, <laughs> or they'll say, you know, say mm-hmm. dynamics, it's but I'm like, no, you're talking about tone. Term. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that that's funny. There's, like, yeah. Oh, there's a there's a really funny YouTube video out there that uh, when I was working at Big Dudes, one of the guys there showed it to me, and I just thought it was hilarious because most of the guys there are, are audio engineers, and uh, it's called Grumpy Sound Guy, mm-hmm. and it it perfectly captures that just disgruntled, grumpy, super critical sound guy mm-hmm. as far as the negative end of musicians yeah, against funny. the sound guy you know? right right yeah and i would wonder too at some a, a place like black dolphin and green lady i mean you're getting some really good musicians in yeah. there so I, I would think that a lot of especially the volumey stuff especially from like drummers for example that are that are 100 percent voluming themselves mm-hmm. i would wonder that they would make your job kind of easy <laughs> you, you know, know? It, it, you know honestly i'm yeah. i'm very fortunate there yeah. because the yeah the people that play there are just so good I mean, ninety nine percent of the time, they're very aware. They're extremely yeah. aware. They're very musical. They are professionals. Yeah. And it, you know, in the jazz world, you know, the way you play and the way you phrase things, you know, I mean, a lot of those players are constantly being critical of themselves as well as the people that they work with. So there's, you know, you you've got to be on top of your stuff. Mm-hmm. And they are. Yeah. So for me, with my environment, it it really does make it easy to appropriately mic people or if I don't need to mic somebody it's okay Mm -hmm. and they get that and they and ultimately they do trust me to take care of them in that their performance will be represented well through the sound system Mm -hmm. which is really cool yeah sure and and like and then with like the big concerts uh it seems like it is just you know blasting bass you know and Mm -hmm. is there is that just a because I mean, you get to a sprint center or something; it's just not possible. Their sound guys are idiots. It's not no. possible. Well, and that's you know? that's like, a very yeah. difficult. That's a totally yeah. different animal. An arena is it's a giant space, and it's very unpredictable because you have this massive concrete floor, and then with with big shows like that, they're tours, so they have they're traveling with all of their equipment for the most part, or they'll hire a local production company to provide audio and lighting and then their technicians come in and do their thing day of show after everything goes up right but that's all modular pa and lighting and as far as you know the the low frequency content and stuff i mean think about it this way you have a twenty thousand seat arena that you have to get as much coverage as possible so the people that paid a hundred bucks plus per ticket are gonna get the best experience possible. Mm-hmm. So from there, it boils down to, it's not just the sound guy, you also have a system technician and you have stage hands that are, you know, the technician ultimately decides what system goes in place, what speakers go where, what configuration is used to get the best possible coverage mm-hmm. and the best possible sound quality. And then you have stage hands that assemble all of that. And then you have your front of house engineers that ultimately drive the show. Mm-hmm. But those systems are a lot more complicated. It's it's so much more than just a stereo sound system. Mm-hmm. You have zones of subwoofers, you have mm-hmm. front fills, you have a primary line array, you have side hangs, you have side fills coming back down on the band. Seven monitors, you know, or a good oh, t- ten monitors, well, with, or however many, yeah. With a lot of shows, it's all in-ear in monitors. Ear, yeah. Yeah. And, the, and then you've got wireless, and you have a guy that's an RF coordinator. So there's there's a lot more moving parts in shows like that. But mainly as far as just that pounding bass, you know, a lot of shows that you see at Sprint Center are rock or pop. Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes with the territory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they they put sound systems in place for those shows to reproduce that and to cover the entire venue so people get what they paid for. Yeah. And I wondered, too, I've heard I've heard this a lot with and this is not just big shows, but in restaurants as well. Uh, not even restaurants, but rock bars. They'll they'll turn up the music like louder than it seems necessary. But I always forget that they don't want people standing there talking to each other. They want you, you know, watching the show. The focus, yeah. So they they turn the volume up so you can't talk to each other. Or the girl and guy have to get all close, you know. And so they're getting you more drinks, and the girls and well, guys are, you know. I didn't think of that whole idea. I've I've had a interesting experience with that um, with with Green Lady and Black Dolphin. That is a very interesting environment where a lot of people do go there for for date night or what have mm-hmm. you. But at the same time, like Black Dolphin, it is predominantly a listening room, and I've 
I've been on both sides of the spectrum where, you know, you keep it a little bit loud so it gets over the noise and people mm -hmm. aren't as focused on their own little worlds. But at the same time, there's also a point where you don't want it to be too loud because you don't want it to be unpleasant yeah. for people that go there because the volume in a live venue is so tricky because it's a lot of the time genre dependent mm. when it should be space dependent in my opinion mm. and also i mean being exposed to loud sound for a long period of time does damage and you know you go to some of these these venues in town where their 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 engineers have been there for a long time and it's just crazy crazy loud mm. It doesn't seem that way to them because they've been there forever, and uh, there's some hearing damage there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Everybody who works there doesn't, you know, it's got fifty percent hearing, mm -hmm. you know. So they're like, what? and even for me being a, mm -hmm. a professional funny. in that industry, that's something that I'm very mindful of as far mm -hmm. as volume, both from the patron perspective of you know how does that affect their experience to me as far as this being a potential work hazard. So I try to kind of skirt the divide between you know being loud enough to be full and enjoyable but not so loud that it's damaging to the patrons or myself mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting and yeah. on another on another where i was originally going with this with um with some performers you know they try to get in a more intimate environment and what i will do you know when, on a packed weekend night where there's a lot of people talking and it, it is starting to encroach upon the group I'll leave the volume where it is because eventually someone who is there to see the show will pipe up and shush and then the room gets quiet and that prevents me from having to make things louder and eventually unpleasant. Yeah, sure. So it depend, but that's also genre dependent too. This is, you know, jazz you're dealing with. Right. Um, like maybe Ida Macbeth or somebody like that where like a female singer and they're doing this ballad and then the audience is kind of accidentally you know someone talking might just be like hey then, man yeah. I'm, I'm here to see this right, right and then that kind of snowballs and the situation kind of balances blows, itself yeah yeah that's interesting it is yeah but like with a rock show or with a more funky group i mean someone may come up and be like hey man turn this up a little more mm -hmm. so just it depends on what people are there to uh to enjoy you yeah, know yeah. are they there to really process the performer and the music that they're playing and really try to take it apart as a multitude of different facets or are they there just to have a good time and you know just move around and shake their butts a little bit right 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 yeah so so switching gears to recording itself um you mentioned a couple minutes ago about tape mm -hmm. and and i the only time that i've even heard about tape when i was listening to like the making of dark side of the moon mm -hmm. documentary mm -hmm. and they were talking about splicing uh -huh. uh, the uh on the run if mm -hmm. you know that tune you know mm -hmm. with the, the, all, all the walking <laughs> and the, yeah, the, yeah yeah the sense that the, whatever that thing was that they the were arpeggiator yeah yeah and, yeah and that was crazy because they were you know he was like do 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 and then do 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 you know and they were using this module to speed it up and slow it down and they had the, I don't know whatever they called this thing, but it was just this little thing with some knobs on it. And like, uh, uh, Roger Waters was like, you know, going mm -hmm. to eat crap with that thing. And like, but with the tape, like ex explain to people how that works. It, Cause all we know is, you know, you play into the mic. Now you play into the mic and it goes in the computer and then you're fine. okay. You know? yeah, well, before computer, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the only way you could record music well, originally, the, the only way you could record music was you had a giant horn mm. that funneled sound into a diaphragm that moved a needle on a... It was basically a cutting lathe onto a wax disc. Okay, and wow. the grooves that were cut in that disc were literal mechanical facsimiles of the audio. And then when you put a reproduction needle that basically reversed the process where the vibrations, you know, the needle traces the groove, it transduces into a diaphragm and then comes back out of that horn it would reproduce that audio. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a it was a very primitive capture. It wasn't That'd full That'd be Louis spectrum. Armstrong days. Oh, right, even, yeah, yeah, even before, like, yeah. Enrico Caruso, mm -hmm. uh, Italian opera singer at the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of recordings that were done on wax cylinder or acetate discs. And when you listen to them, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you don't have a lot of high frequency content. Everything past, you know, 
six K or so just isn't there because the medium couldn't transduce that. And after world, after world war one going into world war two, um, it was the Germans that initially developed magnetic tape technology. Mm. And then that became the standard for decades. And what that is, is you have a strip of tape. It's just mylar plastic tape, or at least modern tape is that with an adhesive. And then you have or iron oxide, little flakes of iron oxide that are pressed into that adhesive. And then to record into that, you have a tape head, a record head that's just Electro, just two electromag electromagnets. And where the needle on the uh, wax cylinder machine would cut grooves back and forth, um, your tape head would have fluctuations in the magnetic field. Mm. And that fluctuation in the magnetic field would polarize those particles in the tape. So that effectively was doing the same thing, but in a much higher quality. Right. And especially the wider the, the tape width, the faster the tape speed, you could capture more over more of those iron oxide particles wow. pressed into the tape. And and that was basically the standard for a long, long time. And then as technology evolved, it wasn't just, you know, a mono tape machine. It, you got stereo and then four track, then eight track, then 16, then 24. And then you could link machines together and get, you know, 48 tracks. Yeah. So as time wore on, you got more and more tracks, but the, the allure with tape was it allowed you to edit mm. where with, you know, you got wax cylinders, you got, yeah. you got what you got. That was yeah. it. Now tape was still a laborious thing. You still had to be very prepared when you went into record because a studio time was expensive. Mm -hmm. Tape is expensive, mm -hmm. and, but you could go in and you, after you record a take, you could manually turn the reels of tape to find a, a section of a song and then you could cut the tape with a razor blade mm -hmm. and you could edit out certain things so it, it did allow you to do different things and that also gave rise to a lot of avant-garde electronic music like Milton Babbitt that previously wasn't attainable because you didn't have the ability to manipulate yeah and that's what they were doing with on the run is they would splice those mm -hmm. tapes and then add another and put them together somehow and it allowed like, yeah, you yeah. to also get you know a better end result too because you could record multiple takes of a song and have a click track on one of the 24 tracks and you could also have that you know locked to simpty time code or what have you and that's getting a little further down the road but mm -hmm. you could go in and you could record multiple takes of a song to a click and then you could go through and make edits because of that. So you could take the best parts of each take and then edit them together. Mm -hmm. Now again, it's, it's a labor intensive right. process to do yeah. that with tape because you have to find the right point and then once you make that cut, you can't uncut the tape. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so you, it, there was definitely a very small margin of error there. Right. And there are some guys that are still just so, so good at that. Uh, Tony Maserati is, uh, he's a mm. very famous recording engineer who's very, very good at that. Yeah. And he's got some really brilliant YouTube videos about how he works with tape. And there's a couple of, uh, there's one in particular that I found that was him doing a post-production edit. And he's like, well, if I did things right and didn't make myself look like a complete idiot, this should be about right. And then play. But even this guy who's got, you know, Grammys, he's got this beautiful mm. studio in Chicago. He's still like... Yeah, if I did this right, mm -hmm. it should be fine. Mm -hmm. That's funny. I know I heard uh, they were talking about this on Ken Burns Jazz, going back to mm -hmm. your, uh, not sousaphone, what is, uh, phonograph or... You have wax cylinder, and phonograph was the next iteration. That was the was next the one, disc. yeah, yeah. I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, he was talking about that uh, Louie had to like go into the hallway... Right, mm -hmm. because they had the, it's just like a condenser at that point or a condenser mic, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this one spot, and, and we're all that to funnel and, into and, it. and this trumpet is just insane and loud and stuff. So he's like literally back in the hallway, you know, in order to balance. Mm -hmm. it. I don't know. That was that that cracked me up when they were talking about that because uh, all of us have dealt with condenser mics before. Oh yeah, now, even nowadays and how oh, yeah. how you deal with that. That always cracks me up. I'm sure you've seen like bluegrass style. Oh they have the yeah, one mic man. And they've got the five guys and. They're all, you know, the you know the the one guy like ducks out of the way and the fiddle is, mm -hmm. and then now they're and then he's I, and it's this whole dance thing. When to it's get done to right the, though, it's so cool, yeah. man. The band is literally mixing itself yeah, on, a, on one fun. microphone. Yeah, 
Um, I had an opportunity to do some work at the Folk Alliance the last year that it was mm-hmm. here um, and got to do some work with one of the, the labels that was a pretty heavy hitter too and got to uh, do some work with John Oates and some other cool people. Mm-hmm. But it, I got to see a lot of that and it it really is this just amazing art form and it the the microphone that you choose is definitely very important as far mm-hmm. as how sensitive is it, is it directional, mm-hmm. that kind of deal and... But in that situation, they definitely had some really good equipment that worked well for that environment sure. because that's such a well-established event mm-hmm. in that community. But it was it was so cool to see that. And, and it's like with the groups that are really good at it, you know, you, you can tell they're very seasoned and they've been doing it for a long time. Mm-hmm. But that just, even from the stage too, being able to just duck in and out, in right. and out. And, and as a listener, you're like, yeah. what? <laughs> this is awesome. Right. Because that... Uh... Because they'll have like mandolin, guitar, You'll have banjo, mandolin, fiddle, and steel and, player, and, right? Steel and and like and that's so funny because I'm sure you guys recording wise have dealt with this a lot with the direct, not the directional mics, but the directional instruments too. Mm-hmm. You know because uh, that's a big thing with orchestras, right? Oh, yeah. Is you have the cellos all pointed because the audience is here and the cellos are all pointed towards the wall. First violins, their F holes are kind of out to the audience, you know, mm-hmm. and the same thing with them where your uh, where your mandolin. I mean, it's really coming this way, so you have to put the mic and the violin. If I'm standing scroll to the mic, I mean, yeah, my you're shooting everything really, out that way. So that's why you're you now you have to manipulate right, yourself to yeah. get. On that, I mean that that's crazy. I mean that's funny to me, but that would be way different from the guitar players because they're just, yeah. the, or electric guitar because they're just plugged in and then they're just. Yeah. Off and running. That's yeah, all good. Especially the wireless. Oh, yeah. Man. And wireless. Now, they don't give a crap where they're... Doesn't where matter. They're, yeah. It, yeah. The, the technology has evolved to a point that in that situation, yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Because mm-hmm. you've got stationary amplifiers that are mic'd, and then, you know, the sound guy does what he needs to do there, and the performers can just do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. So, and, okay, so for recording, are there any, like... Maybe not even pet peeves, but something that kind of the... Not even the green lady stuff, you know, quality players, the really good players, but kind of the guys that are under them that haven't really recorded much. Is there something that you see a lot of people doing well, that is kind of frustrating at, during recording? Well, the thing with recording is there is definitely a, a standard as far as how you do things to be time efficient and to get the best possible capture. And a lot of people who are green to it don't understand that. They just come in with whatever preconceived notions they have, and they don't really know. And this isn't all the time. This is, mm-hmm. you know, isolated incidents. But they don't know how to look past that. And then when a, you know, they go to a studio and they have an engineer, they don't understand that you know the engineer is there to just be the engineer. He's not necessarily there to produce what it is you're doing. And people don't understand that a lot of times you do want someone else that's also kind of making the musical calls like, well, what if we tried this a little bit faster? Or what if we tried some different pedals in this section on the guitar? You know, I mean, the engineer can do that, sure. But with a lot of... It's not his project. Yeah, it's, it's not his project, project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not his... It's, it's your art, right. man. <laughs> but uh, I wonder if you guys get a lot of... Uh, and then I, I'm sure this happens every single time where you, people come in and they're like, oh, wow. You know, I mean, they listen to it and they're like, wow, I did actually make six mistakes well, the, in this. The, yeah, take, and that's, you know, and that was my next point. Instead the big of the thing, one that yeah. I thought I did. Yeah. You know? The big thing is preparation. You know, mm-hmm. if you walk, if you feel you're at a point where you need to buy studio time to record your project, be prepared. I mean, mm-hmm. you're the one that feels that this is something that should be captured and put into a format that can be given out to people. Mm -hmm. You want it to be the best that it can be. Mm -hmm. So when people come in and they're like, oh, can I, I I need to do that again. I need to do that again. I need to do that again. Mm -hmm. You're wasting everyone's time and especially your own. Mm -hmm. So that's something where as a artist, you need to be aware of, are you really prepared to do this? Musically, financially, you know, are you really ready to do this and have, and another thing is, you know, not just be prepared, but maybe, show this stuff to some other people or play out with it. Um, Phil Lesh has a really great book called Searching for the Sound. And he talks a lot about when the Grateful Dead would record, before they would record, they would tour with 
these songs. Yeah, wow, that's interesting. Not so, the other way around. Yeah. yeah so yeah. by the time they would go in to record something, I mean, they they played it live yeah. for a couple of months. So it'd be, they it's knew everything yeah. back to front, and it and you know a lot of their records are really really good and really experimental, and it shows. Mm -hmm. And they also threw a ton of money at everything they did. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I I wonder too, and then because I have a. I have a pet peeve about tracking. I talked about this with Mike Moreland when he was on the show, mm -hmm. and I, like, I understand tracking. You track the drums, track the bass, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm always, I'm not in the jazz world, but definitely I understand the jam band jazz live thing mm -hmm. and orchestra music. I mean, that, that you you can't track that. Yeah, you you, you got to just let the orchestra play, mm -hmm. and you record it, and it is what it is. And I like that. It's so much more raw and stuff. Yeah, it's it's a lot more visceral. Absolutely. And, but I understand why pop guys, you know, go in there and they want to, you know. Well, it's get the it reason perfect. behind that is, you know, yeah, you want you want the the best possible end product. Mm -hmm. And when you do separate, tr when you do overdubs like that, it allows you to get the cleanest possible recording because you don't have any bleed. Everything yeah. is done separately. So the end product is ultimately much cleaner. But some people and some genres just don't call for that. I mean, there there are. I mean, you you look at the Beatles with Sgt. Mm -hmm. Peppers, they did overdub, but they did it in a very weird way. They would capture certain things on certain tracks and then they would ping pong those and, and consolidate them on another tape machine because they had two four track studers and they would fill up one machine and then bounce those to one track on another machine and then go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And if you ever hear the, the actual multi-track archive of that, you'll hear like background vocals and French horn on one track. Yeah, that's weird. And then, and that'll be pan hard left. Yeah, right. And yeah. then background vocals and the drum or and and drums are on one track. So it's like, it was definitely the 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 infancy of of multi tracking, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of experimentation. But the sum of all of that is this legendary record, mm -hmm. and it you know the individual tracks you're like how did that ever come together to be worth anything All right yeah but then you hear it and it's whoa yeah. this is actually pretty cool so i mean it and now it's a little different instance but i mean you can go to records that have been recorded live and they they sound pristine they sound amazing because it you know the space was right the the instruments chosen were correct the mics used i mean it, everything worked and everything gelled in that environment and it came together as something that is amazing. So it's not to say that live tracking is bad. I I'm, I'm not opposed to it. It just mm -hmm. it I'm going to say the 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 two words it depends a lot in yeah, this interview because yeah. it's true. It, every That's the that lesson it sounds like. That's the lesson is that yeah. you, it's it's hard to put a And yeah, there's there's rule. no steadfast well, you yeah. got to do it this way in this environment. That's mm -hmm. just not the way this works. Yeah. Do you find ever that uh because this has happened when I was recording my couple albums back in college is that when I would go in there and record myself, sometimes it would, you know, take that six or seven times. Mm -hmm. And then the last time sounded pretty darn good. And we're like, mm -hmm. yep, that's the one. But once in a while, especially with the band guys that I had, uh, I can think of one song in particular that we, we really did it pretty darn good the first time. And then the second and third time was just way worse. Mm -hmm. Does that happen to you quite a bit where sometimes the first time is the best and oh, then yeah. you start psyching your, is it because people are psyching themselves? Oh yeah, out absolutely. Like, yeah. Cause I, yeah, I've, I've seen that where people are prepared. It's just, yeah. it's one thing to practice your parts in your home where it's, it's your area of leisure and, and it's where you feel safe. You know, it's a, it's the most familiar environment you have. And then you take that and try to do the same thing in a completely foreign environment where, you know, there's all this expensive equipment, you're paying for your time, you know, and there's this ex expectation of mm. professionalism. Then all of a sudden, oh man, I yeah. hope I don't mess up. I hope I don't mess up. Yeah. And then of course, as soon as you start saying, I hope I don't mess up, you start messing up. Yeah, yeah. There's all this pressure, this weird extra yeah, and stuff. Yeah, and it's not yeah. even that there is pressure. It's just it, yeah. you put yourself in that environment, and that's just the things that you think about. Mm. And yeah, you totally psych yourself out. Yeah, I think that would probably happen a lot. And, and I, I would wonder if the first shot kind of thing would happen a lot with people that are prepared. They're like a band, you know, where they, just, like maybe the live thing where we're used to doing. We don't get two shots at a at a gig. Exactly. You, you just exactly. get the one shot, and, and you just and it is what it is. Yeah, 
And so I would wonder if that would happen. But I'd, I'd bet most of the people obviously sit there three, 10, 20 mm-hmm. shots through this little solo and they, you know, they got to go through the... Well, and you know. any more, I mean, you can do that, sure. But with modern technology, with any, any, any DAW, uh, digital audio workstation, like Pro Tools, Logic, whatever, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can get you know, five or six really strong takes and then you can compile those together Especially if it's a tune that's right. been locked to a click track. Yeah. Graphically, in, in Pro Tools or, or really any DAW, you've got a grid that shows beats and then you have thicker lines for measures. Mm-hmm. And you can go through and if everything has been snapped to the click, you can literally make cuts right on the, on the yeah. bar lines and move stuff around and compile this perfect take that's already quantized to the rest of the song. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's awesome You know that, that somebody can do that. Mm-hmm. Especially when, when I typically try to record... Uh, I'm usually doing segments because that's what violin is supposed to be doing in a country song. You have sing, 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 boom, you put your little deal in, yeah. nothing, sing, 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 then you put your little thing, or and then you have an intro and you fade it out into the vocal. So you have the snippet, mm-hmm. snippet, snippet, solo, snippet, snippet, you know, and so they can, you know, and then like you just said, you do your four big solos and they go, hold on, you know, the, the engineer's like, hold on a second, this part was really awesome and that part was really awesome on tape four yeah blue and then you're like Boom. oh yeah there just it is. like oh goodness yeah that, that cracks me up mm. i've said this before on the show I, I played this thing and it was barely late you know it was just the, the and the guy goes hold on a second and he just goes you know you know, and, and i'm like okay great i've been playing you know playing <laughs> violin for you know since three and you know trying to get it perfect yeah, all this yeah, and yeah, classical yeah. and then this guy just nerp. and and, it, and, it, you know? and you see it too graphically like, like just like a 30 second off. Mm. Like, oh, come on. That was good. <laughs> it's just was head late, whatever. And that just, that cracked me up when he did that. I was like, it made me feel like crap too, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm spending mm-hmm. all this time when you guys could just fix it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, yeah. that, 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 you know, a, a lot of people bring up the point too is, you know, is that a detriment to real musicality or does it make it more efficient for people to be creative? Mm. Where what side are you on? Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's difficult, mm-hmm. man. You know, I I would say the business side of music it it could be somewhat detrimental because it allows you to create a product without necessarily needing real talent. But you know, you you do that and you put someone like that on a stage, and then you see that it's not really the real deal because you mm-hmm. can't reproduce it live. Right. But on on the same token, for someone like me, I do a lot of I've got a home studio, and I I like to do a lot of writing. And it allows me to be very effective in how I create and how I arrange because I can, I can have ideas for a song and I can put them, you know, in different places inside of that session. And then I can listen to these different parts and think, actually, that would go cool. That could be a potential chorus. What if I put that right next to the verse material mm-hmm. I was working on? And I right. could just click and drag the entire arrangement and just, psh, and then play it and all right, this yeah. works, cool. And then I can move all of that around and then I've sequenced the tune and then I can do what I want from there. Right. So for me, it, it really is an effective creative tool too. It's, it really just depends on, again, it depends. It right. boils down to you know, who's doing it, who's, oper- you know, who's doing the process. Yeah, I, I would think a lot of times too, I was frustrating in my, one of my, or my two albums that I did where I wanted to put violin all through the song and mm-hmm. then I realized that when, if, when I go play this live, I'm not going to be able to sing, uh, you know, with this right, violin, right. so I'm like, I'm going to have to, okay, I need to do my intro, when I sing, I sing, and then I'll have my big violin solo. And then I'm, I sing, and so I, I kind of realized that this happens a lot, I bet, with people that put like background choir in the album and then they go tour and they're, they're not touring with a 12 person choir, you know? Yeah. And so, so like that, that sometimes frustrates me when I hear that on the album, but then I, th- this happens a lot with solo acts, I think, mm-hmm. is they, they do a band solo act, but then they're like going and touring yeah, as it's a just solo acoustic, act. yeah. I, I don't know. I, like that seems silly to me. I understand why, how fun that must be in the studio to have drums with myself oh, yeah. but I'm like this isn't your act you have well, a three it, piece but then you're you're asking me to come fill violin and I'm like yeah your songs would sound good with violin but you're a three piece without violin and you're gonna go tour without violin why'd you put violin on your album yeah I don't know like uh, well, I don't I mean, know yeah, yeah. some groups you know they do the record a certain way and then live is a little different and mm-hmm. that's what people come to expect from them and that's cool 
And, you know, if, if you're a really good performer, if you do decide to do that and you deviate from the record in, in the live environment, you know, be innovative, make it cool, make it interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a certain, you know, number of musicians for the tour, utilize that and, and maximize mm -hmm. it. Now, if it's like you said, where it's you know a solo artist who's got this fully produced, beautiful record with a full band and all of this stuff, and they're on tour just as a, a singer songwriter with an acoustic guitar, yeah, it leaves a lot to be desired. And that's yeah. something where you know you have to ultimately make the decision of well, maybe I should plan for this a little better and budget for having musicians with me so the experience is better. Yeah. You've got a much more live environment you've got more musicians to fill out the texture more and the show is more engaging because mm -hmm. yeah. it, it can be difficult with you know with a solo artist with something like that to be effective as a performer and to really captivate the audience yeah <laughs> it really <laughs> you know, really yeah, is yeah, yeah. but then you look yeah. at people like Tommy Emmanuel mm -hmm. who who can do it are yeah. unbelievably good at it yeah. you know but he's adjusted his guitar style to this fit that is true, though, right? I mean, he's he's but adding in. There's that word. He adjusted. Yeah, he adjusted. Yeah, because he's doing bottom bass, you yeah, know, he's notes, doing, yeah. and while he's doing the other thing, and then he's got melody singing, and, mm -hmm. and like, he's got harmony, bass, and melody like going with four fingers, which is not possible. And then but he sings he or whatever. <laughs> he's don't sing or he's not, you know. So, uh, so we're probably about wrapping up here. What? Do you have any like a gig or something that you'll never never forget? Oh, you know, man. or, or sure like do. some yeah. To, I sure to do. Uh, this was when I was still at UMKC and I had just transferred out of the uh, concert choir to conservatory singers, which is the higher level audition mm -hmm. choir at the at the at that time. I think they've changed the format a little bit since I've been there, but. Uh, uh, Star Wars in concert was coming through town mm -hmm. at the Sprint Center, and it's you know it's the Royal Philharmonic. Uh, Anthony Daniels, the guy who was who played C three PO, narrated the show. That's funny. And for those couple of tunes from uh, Episode One, where there's a choir in the background, mm -hmm. they hire local collegiate choirs to sing that stuff in every That's city cool. that they're in. So they hired UMKC to do the choral stuff. So we got to be the choral section for those songs behind the Royal Philharmonic mm. in the Sprint Center with 20,000 people, mm. this giant production budget with pyrotechnics and lasers and lights. Mm. I mean, it was, it was everything that, you know, teenage me had dreamt about, sure. you know, that mm. just rock star moment. And it, it wasn't even, you know, I wasn't acquired. Like, mm. no one knew who I was by any stretch of the imagination or, you know, really the you know the conservatory was just oh there's that choral part from that one song that's really mm -hmm. cool but for me yeah that, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but uh, it was that's so fun. cool because we got our stage passes which were these legitimate it wasn't you know a cheap laminate deal it was a legitimate pass star wars in concert performer we were all on the on the list to get into the performer access at big Sprint. shot yeah and you know we were all in this big locker room and the the tour had bought us you know some some pizza because it was like 40 or 50 people yeah. for the choir and you know we, we went in for rehearsals earlier that day and then we could leave and come back if we wanted to but while we were there eating before the show started anthony daniels himself comes to our locker room That's to introduce fun. himself and he's like i just wanted to introduce myself to all of you thank you so much for doing this with us and of course, someone asks, hey, man, can, can you do the thing? And he goes, okay, I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. And we all just completely lose it. Mm -hmm. So that, that was, that's probably my favorite gig to date. That's fun. Yeah, it's just, it was so, you pinch yourself a little bit. Like, am mm -hmm. I here right now? Is this a yeah. thing? This is awesome. Yeah, right. And that's so funny. I mean, like movie music like that. So, I mean, Star Wars is the pinnacle, you know. Yeah. But uh, a lot of times, uh, it's really interesting when you get to do something like that. Like we've done some really good. Uh, we played a really good ET arrangement, mm -hmm. in, 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 when we went to Europe with uh, Wichita State, and uh, that was really neat, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was it was a really good arrangement. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your guys' was the original. You yeah, know? yeah. It was it was actually yeah. a, a Lucasfilm. Yeah. 
So it wasn't like it was ba- official. It, yeah. yeah, it wasn't like bastard arrangement. No. So these, yeah, you know, it's <laughs> and like it's the, the real, Royal yeah. Philharmonic playing it. Sure. It doesn't get better than that. Yeah. And there was this giant LED wall behind us that was was showing the clips of the movies that those songs coincided oh, that's with. Fun, so yeah. yeah, it was so cool. Yeah, we got to do that one time too, where we did a. Uh, a silent movie or whatever and we got to do the fe- the, oh, the music. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It was quick though. I mean, it was it was maybe it was really old. I mean, it had to have been 40s or 20s or something. I can't remember what the movie was, but it was only maybe 26 minute movie or something, but that was pretty fun cuz he was, you know, the conductor was like, you know, wait for the bicycle to come. Okay. And you Cute, know, yeah. yeah, okay, you know, it was it was really it was silly. I don't know what to think about that, but it was it was pretty fun to do. I'm sure. Uh, and you said that was at Sprint Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, and that would have been probably 2011. Yeah, 2012. So it, was, it was a while ago. ago. Yeah, that's cool, man. It was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, uh, there you go. Um, this is Andrew Wilson. Howdy. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks man. for having me. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yep, we'll be back next time talking about stuff. See you and guys thanks. later.